This is the Working Drummer Podcast. Working Drummer Podcast. Featuring ground level pros from all styles and regions. Real drummers with real stories about making a living in music. Hey everyone, I'm Matthew Kraus. And I'm Zach Albetta. And welcome to the 300th episode of the podcast Working Drummer. This milestone for us is coinciding with the end of a year unlike any other. 2020 has affected our lives, careers, relationships, and uh, lives behind the kit in ways we could never have imagined. So today we want to highlight some of our most memorable interviews of 2020. We're going to hear from a handful of former guests who we feel best articulate ideas that kept coming up. Obviously, the various ways COVID was affecting the lives and careers of our guests, but also the intersectionality of the music industry and the racial justice movement, concepts around technique and technology the drummers have been exploring at home during this time, and the psychological reckoning many of us have been going through, taking stock of what really matters to us and what our priorities should be moving forward musically and otherwise. True to our form, uh, some of these are big names, some are lesser known, but they all had insights on these topics that we think are definitely worth taking to heart, proving once again that there is no one way to do this life in music, and even though all of our paths are different, one person's experience and perspective can be a game changer for anyone. So we hope you enjoy this look back at some of our favorite conversations from our least favorite year. So we're also really excited to welcome a few more uh, new sponsors in 2021 and uh, to kick off the year and and, uh, help celebrate our 300th episode. um, They are getting together to furnish uh, the first of three prizes that we're giving away uh, for this 300th episode. And we're calling this the Tone Package. So our new sponsors are Big Fat Snare Drum, Booty Shakers, Aquarian, and uh, Kicker which is a kick muffling system. Um, And Aquarian, it it should be mentioned, uh, is one of our oldest, maybe our first sponsor of the podcast. They've been huge supporters of ours. Um, So since everybody is kind of like at home working on sounds, uh, we thought it would be cool to put together uh, a tone package. So this is our first prize uh, for our giveaway. This is going to consist of uh, Two items from Big Fat Snare Drum, their new Boston Cream Donut and the new Black Hole Sun Donut. Um, Two prizes from Booty Shakers. We got the original Booty Shakers for your floor tom and the little Booty Shakers, which are great for snares and rack toms. Um, And then uh, some drum kit tools from Aquarian. There's some tone tabs in there. There's a kick repair kit, I believe. Yep. Um, and, uh, just some, some cool tone altering, uh, stuff from Aquarian. And then lastly, we've got this kicker kick muffling system, which I've got right here. So this is a super cool product from Sinitis USA. Um, and it just, as you can see, it's foam. It just sits inside your kick drum like that. Um, and it's, it's uh, custom measured for whatever size your kick drum is. The first prize we're giving away has this feature in it, which uh, will be uh, a mic stand that sits right in this channel here. So you can just mount your mic inside your kick drum on the kicker. Um, And as you can also see, it's uh, it's really adjustable. These different uh, these different channels kind of come out so you can kind of pick and choose the level of um, muffling you want inside your kick drum maybe best of all it stays put (laughs) i know it's a big pain in the butt for all of us to be like reaching inside the kick drum and folding the laundry inside there (laughs) so uh so that's one of the coolest features that i like about this thing it sounds great um it's just a really well made uh sort of uh intuitively designed product so that is first prize our tone package Here's how you can enter to win one of our 300th episode prize package giveaways. We've posted this episode on Facebook and Instagram, and all you have to do is repost it and tag Working Drummer Podcast. If you do this on both Facebook and Instagram, you'll be entered twice. You'll have one week to enter. Winners will be selected at random and announced on Friday, January 15th. Thanks to our giveaway sponsors, Aquarian, Booty Shakers, Big Fat Snare Drum, Gibraltar Hardware, and Kicker by Sinitis. So uh, here's a cool thing that's been happening recently is we've got a relationship with Air Gigs that we've been working with um, David Blacker 
the CEO of Veridigs. We had a great conversation with him, and we were able to extract like seven really great points and helpful tips for those that are interested in air gigs or that are already on the platform like you and I are, but need to up our game. And today we're going to feature the very first of those seven, and then we're going to have those over time. But if you are a Patreon member and supporter of this podcast, you have early access to all seven of these tips and this whole uh, conversation condensed. And we've got some great reaction uh, right away from a really awesome supporter and friend of the show, Isaac Sanchez. I received a message from a drummer and LA resident, Michael Collins, who's been a big supporter of the show just this morning. He writes, hi, Matthew, hope you are doing well. Just wanted to say thanks for the podcast talking about air gigs. I'm starting to feel confident enough to do this kind of thing, and it was so helpful. What you bring to the drumming community is really awesome and positive. Stay safe out there. And that's so, awesome. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was. I was like, man, that was great. And and this is something we haven't really done with Patreon is give early access to this content. So I wanted to share that with y'all. Michael said, please share it. Yeah. And it's, it's so cool that the timing is working out great. Um, you know, so many of us are in the same boat where we're having to, uh, uh, you know, pursue more remote recording work. Um, and so, you know, this, this partnership, this opportunity with air gigs, um, just really came along at a perfect time for us, perfect time for them. Um, and, uh, you know, like you said, I learned a lot. I was already on air gigs, but I learned a lot from this conversation we had with David, just about how to really maximize, um, you know, your, your use of, of that platform. Right. Here's the yeah. first of seven segments for air gigs that we can share with you. The most obvious question for a lot of our listeners who aren't familiar with air gigs, what is air gigs and how would you describe it to someone? And, uh, especially to our listeners who are, you know, most likely drummers. Yeah. Um, that is a natural first question. So, um, air gigs began in, uh, 2012. It was kind of the first marketplace platform for hiring pro studio musicians, vocalists, and, uh, audio engineers. And, um, you know, since has kind of grown into a, a nice hub for, for this kind of thing, this kind of work. And um, yeah, now there's music creators all over the world and session musicians working from their own studios doing sessions on the, on the site. And what was your inspiration? Like, what's the origin story with, with Air Gigs and you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was um, largely just because at the time I wanted to use a service like Air Gigs and it didn't really exist. So I was kind of like the perfect customer for a business that didn't exist. And I kind of had... You know, my partner and I uh, had been running recording studios in New York from the early 90s up to about 2010. And all of our friends were, you know, and colleagues were working remotely. And it was it was all sort of brewing at that time. And then, you know, we moved out to um, Southern California and we were in a new environment. And I, when I say I wanted to use it, I wanted to use it from a, a buying perspective, you know, hiring talent perspective. And, you know, we were in a new environment. We didn't know many people and we were trying to get, you know, some uh, some songs off the ground that we were working on. And uh, I was like, we should really start this. And, and so that's sort of where it all began. And we it started very humbly. We just sort of put up a very rudimentary kind of website and put it out to our friends and, you know, musician friends and engineers. And it's just grown sort of organically over the years. The more I learned about it, the more I was like, this is this is like Uber or Lyft for musicians, but it pays way better and it's just for musicians or TaskRabbit or something like reverb is to Craigslist. It's like Craigslist, but just for musicians. Exactly. It's this great way to just sort of branch out and find uh, work if you're looking to get hired or find people if you're looking to hire them. We've broken up this 300th episode into four different segments. Uh, first of all, it's really difficult to find some of our favorite segments from, uh, you know, our, all of our guests. And I just have to say that everyone that donates their time 
and that provides content for our podcast is 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 there's just so much love for that and uh there's no contest here in picking there's just relevance to what's been happening especially in 2020 but the last 100 episodes goes all the way back to the beginning of 2019 uh, we had our 200th in uh, January of 2019. Uh, it's crazy to think that it's been that long, but uh, there's so much that's been happening, so much that's been changing over the last couple of years that um, what we've chosen here, uh, we could go on and on and on and on, but for the sake of time, we've just broken it down. So the first segment we have is home studio because that's been huge. Everyone's been stuck at home, quarantine. And as we've mentioned in many recent episodes, there's been so much talk about getting your home studio together. And so uh, that's been a topic, and we've had some guests that have just been killing it either for years or they've really dialed it in recently. So the first guest I want to talk about, and we've got some quotes or we've got some you know, segments from that interview that we're going to play for you, uh, is our guest Kip Allen. Uh, in this kip, in this clip, <laughs> uh, Kip talks about the value he finds in spending his practice time dialing in sounds and tones and all these things. Not only are we spending a lot of time, you know, practicing as we normally would, uh, you know, practicing rudiments and songs and, and and preparing for gigs, but in the the new gig, the new norm is recording at home, and so not only do you have to provide performance. Uh, to the track, you have to provide a great sounds, great tones. And so to, to do that is just so important. That was a huge takeaway. Another huge takeaway for me in talking to Kip Allen was the effectiveness of posting on Instagram. And he's done so, he's done such a great job in uh, procuring work just by posting short things on Instagram. And uh, so that kind of lit a fire for me. I'd started to do that and in a very short amount of time started to get some attention, which turned into work. Uh, so that's been real, that's been awesome. So here is a clip from Kip Allen. I'm learning that you don't have to be this savant of a drummer, but if you have incredible tones and incredible sounds coming out of your house, people will hire you much quicker than they would the savant with okay sounds. Yes. That's the way I've been seeing my practice time lately. So I've been really splitting off, not just drumming in the practice room, but I'll walk in and I'll fire up whatever Pro Tools logic and start going and I'm like, okay, I'm gonna work on the snare sound today. And I'll not only just start with the computer, I'll take my headphones off, I'll tune the snare to where I think it should be. Mm -hmm. And then I'll put the mic on it and realize that I completely screwed it up. And I'll be like, okay, now how can I dig myself out of this hole? Should I tune it again or should I EQ it? Should I compress it differently? So I just start trying to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And yeah, but sometimes it's hard when you don't have something to build tones around. So like if I'm just getting drum sounds, yeah, don't have a song in front of me, don't have a vibe. I'm just like, okay, let's just get sounds. That's when it can get a little hairy because you start to, go crazy and like, okay, I'm gonna make the snare sound like this. And I'm gonna make Tom sound super weird and nah, 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 nah. Just, you just keep going. And all of a sudden you realize at the end of it, you're like, oh my God, I have a horrible drum sound. It sounds muddy and discombobulated because it's, I'm trying to make everything the focus, if that makes sense. I'm trying to make the toms the focus, the kick the focus, the snare the focus. Mm -hmm. I've noticed sometimes if you just make one or two things the focus, and by the focus, I mean like the strong suit of the, the sound. Right. So the snare, Maybe I want it to just be so in your face, just just like, oh, it's like a smack to the face. Mm -hmm. But then the kick can't be huge as well, because if it is, it may not fit with the song. It may not fit with the sound, the overall sound image of the kit. Mm -hmm. So that's things I've been learning in practice time. <laughs> but so are you writing songs? Or are you coming up with loops to? Yes. Yeah. So I'm always I mean, you've seen the Instagram yeah, videos. Yeah. Most of those are the products of those practice sessions. Uh -huh. So most of those are like, I use splice a lot just to get loops to play with. So I have a sonic like basis okay. so I can be like, okay, this is the loop. This is how it sounds. This is how much low end it has. Okay. Now how do I fill 
fill the rest of the sound with drums. The loop itself, the yes. low end in the loop, right. the whatever. And sometimes I'll add low end or bass or I'll build a loop out, uh, but I'm not really as concerned with that side as much as I am the drums. Because when I'm making these, I'm making them for Instagram for drummers to watch. I'm not really making them for people to like listen to and write a song to. Yeah. So it kind of definitely focuses on drums more. Yeah. But I try to like have a little more things that are interesting because I get bored watching just drums sometimes, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> yeah. But that's just me. So our next clip is uh, from Jordan Rose who is a New York drummer. Um, I had a great time talking with him. He's just a super positive, funny, fun dude to talk to. Um, and from the home recording standpoint, he's got a little room uh, that he works out of in Brooklyn there. He gets great tones. And not just that, but he finds a great vibe uh, for everything he's playing with. Like if you watch his videos on Instagram, um, you know, he, he appears to be having like just as much fun and grooving just as hard as on his live videos. We talked about, um, you know, getting big sounds out of that room with a very light touch. Um, it was really inspirational and educational to me, like working in this, you know, small room, uh, just starting to figure out how to work with your room and not against it. Um, and he also talked about, uh, Aaron Sterling and how you know the room that aaron sterling is working out of isn't really so different than the ones that a lot of us are working out of but you know people like aaron have found really cool ways to use their rooms to their advantage um you know there's there's no one right way to do this stuff they're not afraid to mess around with tech even if they don't fully understand it which is definitely where i've been at the last six months kind of hunting pecking around uh logic um, so this was just a really cool conversation. It was er kind of early on in COVID and it was early on in my process of, of getting my room together here. Um, so Jordan had just some, some great thoughts and some great tips on, on, uh, getting your room together. I think in my little recording setup that I have here, uh, which is at my apartment in Brooklyn, um, it's not a very big space and I've, I've definitely, you know, tried to track things where I'm hitting quite a bit harder. Mm -hmm. And I listen back and in my mind, I'm like, oh yeah, I, I was really digging in. This is going to sound great. And then I listen back and it sounds kind of choked or something just it doesn't sound as, you know, warm and round as I thought it would, or as mm -hmm. I was hoping that it would. And so I've started to just ex with experimentation with this particular space, um, that if I play a little bit lighter, you know, the sound is bouncing off several surfaces that are not that far from me. And so it's, it actually sounds bigger, um, yeah. in, you know, in this particular case, if I was in a big, you know, avatar studios, maybe I could dig in a little bit more mm -hmm. and, and it would sound even better than it does in my little space, you know, but, um, yeah, I, I think, I think I've just kind of come to realize that I don't have to exert all of my muscle into every note to get a big sound yeah that the drums will speak even with a lighter touch and oftentimes will will sound even better right yeah. right yeah so yeah so talk about the uh the post process sure sure um so post you know so i record and i just try and get it sounding as good as i can with the original source um, I'm, I'm not, I don't consider myself a engine, audio engineer or a mixer. I consider myself a drummer who has a vision of how I want my drums to sound. Mm -hmm. And so at this point, it's just, it's been a lot of experimentation, you know, had a ton of time with the quarantine. And so I've just been diving in and, uh, you know, trying some different overhead setups and I, I purchased some tutorial videos from Dan Bailey. I'm not sure if you're familiar. Yeah, I've heard that Dan. name, I feel like. Yeah. He's out on the West Coast. He has a really great uh, recording setup, gets fantastic sounds. Um, and he's the MD and, and drummer for several years now for Father John Misty. Okay, yeah. And, um, and he also did one of these Who videos, uh, the double drum collabs and we kind of became connected that way. Yeah. It's been really cool, but he's, um, why did I bring him up? Oh, the instructional DVDs. I, I purchased those from him. It's like an online 
download thing and have been just spending a little bit of time um, every day. You know, he talks about um, getting different sounds, vintage sounds, modern sounds. Uh, and he kind of just goes through his whole process. And um, and I like the, the sounds he gets. So I figured, hey, might as well learn from a guy who I really like what he's doing. Right. And um, so, yeah, those have been helpful. But after kind of experimenting and getting sounds that I think, oh, that sounds cool. It seems like there's no phase going on between the, the overheads or whatever. Um, then I'll just sit down. I, I record into Pro Tools and I'll, I'll mess around with some, some uh, plugins. I recently got the Isotope Neutron 3, I think it's called, um, which I wasn't too familiar with, but a friend of mine works for them and, and wanted me to check it out. So... And honestly, I've been blown away. Like they have these uh, these presets for you know whatever kick, snare, toms, hi hat, room, overheads, and I've just been kind of like going through them, and they kind of drastically change the sound, mm -hmm. which I, which I like because then it's like oh this is actually doing something when I right when I hear it you know right right um, and yeah so I've just kind of messed with that and. You know, it's like I with everything. It's a process. I'll 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 hit that preset. If any real like mix engineers are listening, they're probably like, "Oh, this guy is an amateur." <laughs> you know? <laughs> well, I don't think so, man. I mean, maybe maybe so, but I I can't tell you how. Like since I started this process in my room, um, yeah. you know, I'm 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 just flying blind. I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. <laughs> so I'm going into logic and and just you know turning knobs and hitting buttons and trying out <laughs> trying out different rooms in the reverb presets and trying mm. out different things in the compression presets so i think m most uh you know most drummers and i would imagine most home musicians or home studio musicians are kind of going through the same process of like hunt and peck and trial and error and uh you figure out what you like and what works for you absolutely absolutely yeah. Just another note on that, um, something that was kind of encouraging in this whole drummer home recording world, which I feel like is rapidly growing mm -hmm. because of technology and just the need, you know, um, several years ago, probably four years ago now, I took a private lesson over at Aaron Sterling's studio in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And and it was all about home recording because I was interested in, you know, getting more into it. And one thing that stood out to me from that lesson is, is he was like, um, he was saying, you know, for those that are not familiar with Aaron, he's recorded with everyone, right? John Mayer, Taylor Swift, right? You know, just his list is is huge. But he was saying seventy five percent of his work now is from his home studio. Yeah. And whereas it used to be a hundred percent of his work was in you know the big studios. Right. And and within a couple of years time, once he started doing home recording. And he started just like us. He said, he's like, you know, I've, I've recorded a ton in studios, but I didn't know anything about engineering. Mm -hmm. And so he's like, I invested in some gear and started messing around and asking questions to my friends and et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, this was four years ago. So probably even more now, you know, probably 80 or 90 percent of his work is there in his little home studio. And it's it's, you know, just like you, it's a bedroom. It's nothing right crazy but he's but we're hearing his recordings on the radio on massive recordings yeah sounding sounding fantastic so yeah, that yeah. was kind of encouraging to me we've got a couple more segments on the home studio thing but before we go any further i want to talk about sure because sure has been a sponsor for the podcast the last few months and we're real excited about having uh this having this great, amazing company uh, partner with the Working Drummer Podcast. One of the things that I've been able to get with Shure is the SM7. And as a drummer, it's been a game changer. As a percussionist working from home, as a podcaster, obviously it's a game changer. It is known as, a, you know, a really popular uh, microphone for voice, uh, you know, speaking and singing. But uh, I can tell you, it's such a clean mic that it's it's cool for. I mean, I'm, I'm experimenting. I'm using it on the hi hat. I know people that use it on snare drum, kick drum. So I'm excited to be able to use it. But here's the one thing: the hugest takeaway for me recently has been percussion, because the tone of the percussion that I've owned forever 
is completely different through this microphone. This this tambourine down here, this has been like my go-to single hit tambourine. The one. It, dude, I swear to I, I use this all <laughs> the time. It's not always a great at shaker, but man, single hit. It's the tones that come out of this thing have only recently been discovered with the SM7. And I feel like I've got a whole new I've doubled my percussion arsenal just with this microphone. I'm I'm super excited. So the SM7B is uh is just is has been killer. And uh I just want to thank um Laura at Sure and just and sure for uh supporting the podcast and uh, we're real excited about uh our connection with them so thank we're, you we're definitely sure. super grateful super grateful to sure uh and addition in addition to your uh sm7 there uh sure sent me their uh drum set package which is uh a beta 52 kick mic and three sm57s yep um who doesn't need more sm57s i they're just you know, the standard, they work great on toms, they work great on snares, uh, you know, just about anything. Um, and for someone like me, who's uh, sort of, you know, mic collection is still in its infancy, this package was perfect. I already had a couple other kick mics, I did not have a Beta 52, it's one of the standards. Um, I think I had one uh, SM57 um, before that, but now I've got, uh, you know, enough, enough to go around. So, uh, I'm just I'm super happy with how these things are sounding, and again, super grateful to to Sure for partnering with us. And you know this this is a great segue to our next guest we want to feature, which is Grady Saxman, who's a great session drummer here in Nashville. And one of the hacks he talks about for those of us that are working in the home studio and have limited space is using an SM57 to like double your space. And so in this segment, you're going to hear him talk about that. Um, you know, th there's a lot of ways that you can combat this uh, thing that we all have to deal with when we're recording from home. We don't have a big, beautiful room to work with. And, uh, you know, I, I love what you were talking about before, Zach, with, with, you know, even Aaron Sterling has his room and he figures out how to make it work. Well, Grady's got that dialed in. He's got a great studio himself where he produces and he engineers and, of course, he plays drums on. So it was a great conversation uh, with him. And, um, yeah, th this, this, I'm, I'm just going gonna, gonna to run this clip, and it, it kind of speaks for itself. So check this out from Grady Saxman. Unfortunately for drums, just ceiling height is so important because what makes drums breathe on a recording is the uh, the lack of close reflections. The closer your walls are, the faster they're going to reflect into the mic, kind of clouding up the direct sound a little bit. Yeah, it's not going to be as punchy. Yeah, it's not going to be as clear. Uh, the good news is one way to combat that. So like imagine like uh, you're playing racquetball, right? Yeah. Imagine your snare drum is like when you hit the ball, that ball is your 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 sound wave, right? And it's bouncing across the um, all of the reflective surfaces in that racquetball room, right? Yeah, right. Um, so the uh, velocity of which you hit the snare is going to directly determine how long that ball is going to ricochet around the room. So if you're working in a small room. It's very, very important that you play at small volumes. Oh, right. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. So if you want, you know, like even if it's a rock and track, um, mixing yourself for the room is really important when you're specifically talking about home recording because you you might not have, you know, 20 cubic feet of floor space mm -hmm. that you can let that sound kind of naturally die down so if you're in like a bedroom like a 10 by 12 you got some absorbing materials on the walls or maybe you've built some bass traps or something that's going to really help with the energy but if you start playing at a level that is more than what the like the amount of absorption in the room can handle you know what i mean right then uh you're going to start hitting you're going to start getting phase issues even if your polarity is good yeah yeah man that's a great description I, I, and and so many of us ha have limited space that we're working with unless we take over you know the living room for a couple mm -hmm. weeks and that's i mean 
And, and, and when you're working in those limited spaces, that's the, that's when you really, really need to be, um, conscious of your dynamics. Cause a microphone really doesn't care how hard you hit it. I mean, that's kind of a misconception that, that I don't know. I think it came from like that seventies or eighties where like you really did have to cr- smack the crap out of your snare to get it over the cymbals and the room mics, you know, yeah. in a big commercial studio. Uh-huh. Um, and you had all the absorption and uh, the actual you had, like square footage of the room to let it decay naturally. But now if in, in like the quote unquote bedroom recording world, um, that snare, I mean, when you hit the snare and this is all within reason, right? Like you don't have to like really smack the crap out of it because then it's just splaying all over the room mm-hmm. and, and every time it comes back into that 57, you're causing some phase issues. Also, it, it's more important in the overheads as well. I mean, to p- not play your cymbals super loud, there's always, you can always compress it later and make it sound exciting. Um, but the biggest thing I would say, like, if you're in a room that is limited by space, is just trying to control your dynamics. And you'll be amazed at just how much your touch will affect. Um, the end result of the drums, like just popping out of those speakers and having the separation and the width that you want out of the drums. And how much your neighbors will like you for not... Your neighbor, your, yeah, your neighbors will like you. Your wife will love you more. <laughs> uh, you sound like a man of experience here. Um, with <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, I love that, and 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 the racquetball analogy applies to this scenario too. As if you just kind of just lob the ball slowly, you can see how it moves slowly. Giving if you're the microphone and you you know you lob that ball, it's going to reflect back slower to you and give it a chance to do the things that it's supposed to do. Is is what I'm taking away from that. Exactly. Yeah, it's it's going to it's going to give the the microphone more of an opportunity to catch the direct sound, mm-hmm. which is what you ultimately want. You don't want the wall that's 3 feet away from your snare drum to be just bouncing right back into the snare. Yeah. Um also, that's another thing I guess that's worth mentioning. Like if you do have close walls, um try try to use your absorption there, right? Mm-hmm. So um, in the spaces that are a little bit closest to the drums. So like when my room was smaller, when I had shorter ceilings, um, I had eight foot ceilings. And so what I did to kind of combat having a ceiling right above my, my symbols is I put a cloud above mm-hmm. my, my actual overheads. And that kind of gave the illusion of having a bigger space because <clears throat> if I was playing at the appropriate dynamics, it um, was able to absorb that sound energy efficiently to where it felt like it was going way past the mic and not really coming back for a while. So say like you have a 10 by 10 room or a 10 by 12, yeah. put your room, put your room mics in the corner. And honestly, what, what I would even do is a lot of people would, would try to go for like a large diaphragm or like a ribbon mm-hmm. or something like that. But then you're going to be getting a lot more of the room. You might even could get away with using 57, something that's even more directional and put them to where they shoot the farthest distance away from the room or like take two 57s if you want your rooms to be stereo, point them at the wall as that you're looking at, you know what I'm saying, from your drumming yeah, position. Yeah, So you're, you would be extending the, so if you put it kind of in front of the kick drum, point it away from the kick drum at the wall, you'd be extending the length of the room double, you know what I mean? Because you would be getting the reflection off the wall and not the this um, direct sound if you were to point it at the drums. So this was a fun one. Uh, Eric Darkin is a, a really great percussionist, and I've been wanting to talk to him ever since I discovered him just by accident through work. I was asked I was asked to build tracks for an, uh, a new artist that I was working with, and so they gave me all the percussion tracks that were done in the studio and i'm like man this is amazing like this is shaker and tambourine but this is multiple shakers and different tambourines and crazy alien sounds i've never heard before who is this and the producer's like oh that's eric darkin i'm like man i kind of know the name and even at drum paradise you walk in there and you see timpani and everything i'm like wow this is the dude this is the guy 
Um, and he, uh, he's just, he's an, uh, an amazing percussionist, very creative. Um, he utilizes different tones in really non-traditional ways. And the reason why I wanted to put this segment into the home studio thing is because there's so much competition right now as we're discovering, as we're, as we're learning more about online recording and working with air gigs is there's hundreds of thousands of drummers. We're all doing it. And how do you separate yourself from the pack? And sometimes it's just the sounds, the creativity, the tones that you bring. And this is what Eric excels at. I can tell you he has a reputation for walking up and down the aisles of Lowe's or Home Depot with a stick and checking out different tools uh, to find out what makes cool tones and then brings them like, hey, I'm going to bring the uh, and producers say, hey, Eric, make sure you bring your garden weasel. You know, this is <laughs> this is cool, man. Um, so and the garden weasel on an SM7 just holy mwah. man, you hear it. everything, <laughs> everything. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, he's all about bringing different tones and, and, and it's not about like sticking out. It's about something that's felt and not heard. It's something that if you, when you hear it, it feels good. When you take what he did out of the track, you're like, it sounds good, but something's missing, but you can't put your finger on it. It's finding that sweet spot. Here's a short clip, hopefully just to whet your appetite. If I go work on a track, I'm going, what do I need to do? What would make this better? What what would bring this more energy? And why, okay, why would you use two tambourines? Well, I might use a bright tambourine for the backbeat, and I might use a real dark tambourine to tuck in with the hi-hat because the hi-hat to me is too bright. And a mm. lot of this is sort of my how I listen to something. I'm like, okay, so why would you do two shaker parts? Well, I'll put a thin shaker part that is accenting different then the hi-hat in the verses and then in the chorus i'm going to add a really thick shaker and add a maraca to it that's going to give it a real crunchy energy yeah. so i'm thinking about how do i create all these subtle um nuances i'm a big fan of and this is always it's funny you, you mentioned about subtle because i've always been one of those guys i've tried to be one of those guys that i don't i like percussion to be felt and not heard necessarily i don't need to be you know i like what I do to be musical. I hope what I do is musical. Yeah. And I'm not a big fan of my stuff being mixed really loud, unless there's a relevant reason for it. Um, but I'm, I'm reminded when you were talking about, I did a, a number of records for Brad Paisley. Um, Brad Paisley, Darius Rucker, there was a handful of projects that I would do with a certain producer in Nashville. Um, and there was a, we would spend days on these, what I would consider to be fairly traditional country records and it's exactly what you had said. It's like, you know, if, if you take it away, you'll miss it. Yeah. But what I was doing in there, well, like on a Brad record, is I would do a couple of different shaker parts, um, a couple of different tambourine parts. Um, I might even do like an extra little brush snare part, you know. And all of it was, the purpose was to make the groove better or to make it more musical. Um, yeah to enhance it musically. And that if you took it out, you're going, Ooh, something's missing. But when you left it in, it's like, Oh man, this is feeling good. Or, or, you know, you mentioned about what do you add on like, like the last chorus or like on the bridge, I may double a crash symbol. Well, what I'll do is I'll double a crash symbol with maybe like my hubcap that I've distorted. And yeah. when you mix that distorted hubcap really low, you don't hear it, but you feel it. I'm all about, there's things that, that I do that you feel. A uh, prime example was, um, there was a song that Brad did called Whiskey Lullaby. Yeah. And I think we played three big concert bass drums. Well, that ended up being a huge part of that track. I mean, it's a great <laughs> song, and Allison and, and Brad did an amazing job vocally. But as far as the musical side, that bass drum ended up being, it was such a, big part of the song I, mean, I ended up i think i ended up playing on the cmas with it i mean they wanted that bass drum to be that part of the deal that's um, so cool and and you sit there and you go that's just a bass drum well yeah but it was mm. part of creating the cinematic it, it added to the lyric um it added to the whole presentation of the song and so that's that's kind of the way i approach things is um what is this doing how does this contribute um to the song you know that's sort of been my 
motto, I would say, or, or, or sort of how I've approached. It's like everything that I play and do has a reason behind it. The other sort of uh, major uh, cultural phenomenon that, that dominated 2020 other than COVID was uh, just the issue of racial justice uh, in America. And um, there were a couple of interviews we did over the year that um, that sort of touched on this in a few different ways. Um, the first one we want to share with you is uh, Matt Brennan, who uh, is the author of a book called Kick It. And it's uh, he calls it a social history of the drum set. Um, and it's a really interesting look at, at the role that the drum set and drummers have played in, in Western music over the last couple centuries. Um, but I found it just really interesting and really surprising um, that there was this, this, uh, this unexpected connection between drums and drummers being maligned and looked down upon by uh, the music world in general and America's systematically racist history. Um, he, he illustrates this in a few different ways, uh, in the book. Um, and it, it also delves into, uh, how the drums, like the presence of the drums and drum set in music have really bent the arc of music over the last two centuries, um, from a musical standpoint, from a marketing standpoint, uh, from a technology standpoint. Um, and it's just, it's a really cool look at just, like I said, the role that the drum set has played in music and culture. Um, so check out this clip about uh, racial justice as it pertains to the drums. It's wrapped up in the slave trade on the one hand. And also, I think, um, as the book kind of goes on to describe, it's the association of drums and cymbals with military conquest on the other, right? Right, right, and right. With sort of the more brutal aspects of human culture. And, you know, this is at the same time that 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 sort of Western canon of European classical music is being formed, right? Mm -hmm. it, it matters who's in power when those <laughs> narratives of history start to start to come together. Yeah. And it's not an accident that, you know, say, uh, that, but it's not an accident that uh, that those assumptions about percussion as an instrument, as a low status instrument, form at the same time when European imperial power is at its very height. Mm -hmm. Right? There's obviously, uh, you know, those history books are are being written by by people who will portray European concert repertoire as the apex of human achievement. Right. Right. <laughs> uh, and. And also in the mid 19th century, you have things like the the theory of Darwin's theory of evolution, you know, mm -hmm. being published for the first time, and very dangerous leaps being made between talking about how natural selection works to this kind of social Dar Darwinism, which there's much less evidence for, highly speculative. It's making an analogy that very quickly breaks down, where we suddenly think about music as being something which operates by the same rules as biological natural selection and, and evolves up to right. an apex when actually music doesn't work like that at all. Right, right. <laughs> you know, um, it's, it's just flawed logic, but at the same time, that's the logic that predominated in the 19th century. And by the end of the 19th century, when you start to have things like the music appreciation movement develop and people start to write books about, you know, how to, um, how to elevate yourself by listening to quote unquote good music and avoiding the quote unquote bad stuff. You know, this is, you know, this is all tied up in, in, I think what, what ends up being reproduced in, in drummer jokes and, and creating uh, this, this culture where, where the drum kit was, was always going to be represented as a low status, low value instrument. Right, yeah. right. And and just to illustrate to people that that you're, you know, this is not just an idea you came up with. You're, I mean, first of all, your book is is, you know, exhaustively referenced. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, early on, there was this uh, quote from uh, Benjamin Latrobe, who yeah. was a, a traveling architect and engineer. Uh, and I guess was this a journal entry of his from Congo Square? Yeah, exactly. He kept okay. a regular journal. Right. So there's this this journal entry where he's he's at Congo Square in New Orleans and he says, uh, I found a crowd of five or six hundred persons, 
assembled in an open space or public square. All those who were engaged in the business seemed to be blacks. An old man sat astride of a cylindrical drum about a foot in diameter and beat it with incredible quickness with the edge of his hand and fingers. They made an incredible noise, and most of the circles contained the same sort of dances. The allowed amusements of Sunday have, it seems, perpetuated here those of Africa among its former inhabitants. I have never seen anything more brutally savage and at the same time dull and stupid than this whole exhibition. <laughs> yeah. So when I first read that, you know, I, I, I laughed like I just did because, you know, just th the last sentence is like, the drums are brutally savage and stupid, <laughs> Yeah, you know, which, you know, sums up the attitude towards it. But, you know, I thought about it for a few more seconds and I was like, this, this guy is just saying that the drums are a, a subhuman activity. Um, yeah, that's right. And it's, it's very troubling to go back to a lot of the, of, of writing about um, drums and music more broadly in the 19th century, because it's, you know, just, absolutely fraught with these incredibly racist attitudes. Uh, and I think that, again, in the same way that when you're looking for like the, the roots of something that's that might be an innocuous joke on the one hand, or like a fundamental assumption that we're that we make about musical aesthetics on the other, mm -hmm. like what, what music deserves, for instance, like state support or not, right? <laughs> um, you know, it's, you got to go back to these sources. And so, uh, you know, I, I wasn't just reading, you know, history books that were produced in, you know, the late 20th century to get this. I was going back to music history textbooks that were being written in the 1800s and right. trying to figure out like how they made sense of, you know, describing the history of music in, in that century. And yeah, there's so much problematic stuff, but, uh, I, I think it's really important to go back to those original sources in in order to questionize them, in order to like really shine a light upon them and say like, guess what? This doesn't make sense for all of these for reasons A, B, and C, and right. and then trying to present a kind of alternative, hopefully more accurate history of yeah. what was happening. Uh, the second clip we want to introduce to you and and guest we had that it continues with this topic of racial justice, is uh, an old Columbus friend of mine, Peter Retzlaff. Uh, I didn't know him really well. He was, it was a little bit older, but he's been living in New York for a number of decades, and I always remember him as as an amazing player. And growing up in uh, a, a place like Columbus uh, was, was really great for me. It was musically and artistically, it was very culturally diverse. And... Um, so uh, it was a privilege for me to have that experience growing up. Peter had a similar experience uh, growing up in Columbus and then living in New York, which we all know is like the epicenter of cultural diversity. And when at the time when we were doing our interview, things were at a boiling point again uh, in our country. And I... I I felt inspired in the moment to ask Peter about his experience, his knowledge of popular American music as it pertains to the African-American experience, and if he could speak to that. I wasn't sure where he would go with that, but one thing that he pointed out which was amazing, and you'll hear in this clip, is that when you are into music and you're into drumming and you are learning all different styles and you find your mentors, you're going to find people of all walks of life. And so in Columbus, he, his mentors and his teachers were all different uh, from all different ethnic backgrounds. And he, he never thought of it. It, 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 it just never occurred to him uh, who these people were. They were just amazing musicians and amazing people. And this was the experience. This was the takeaway. Uh, it reminded me of going to the School of the Arts and uh, for two years had a very strong black woman as one of my teachers and how important that was for me in my life. And so Peter goes on to talk about the idea that he felt like it was like a bubble that he lived in. Um, this was his experience. This was his American experience. And it's not everyone's American experience. Um and there really wasn't 
a solution or an answer to this as we're all trying to figure out what the answer is to dealing with this, but um, it does kind of helps you take note of the privilege and the responsibility and the honor of this responsibility that we have and uh, as musicians, the experience that that uh, playing music has when it comes to interacting with different cultures and stuff. So check out this clip from uh, Peter Retzloff. From an early age, race didn't really matter to me very much. And I saw and heard that that obviously music from all over the world was like some of the best examples of what a culture has to offer. Yeah. So for me, I just always felt like I had a pretty open mind towards race. And I just, you know, to, to me, it depends on if we're, we could be friends or not. And, uh, you know, the first guitar player I played with, uh, Lance Ellison, he's an African-American guy. So, you know, like I, I knew his parents and I spent a lot of time at his house. And so the point to this is, um, because Columbus is such a, uh, uh, mixed city, at least black and white, um, you know, I, I just found that there was a lot of people to hang out with and, and do music with in some way. And so for me, I, I just feel like, like I got to know other cultures through music. And so when I came to New York, one of the most exciting things was I could meet people from Jamaica who had a firsthand experience of Caribbean music. I met Afro-Cuban people, uh, you know, people that played Afro-Cuban music from various places, mm-hmm. Brazilian people. I remember the day I met Daduka uh, at the collective and I'm like, man, I, I got some questions. Can I ask you? And he was so nice and he continues to be so nice putting up with my questions to this day. And so, you know, I just think music is one of the great equalizers of, of just seeing the greatness of different cultures. And I think the world we live in is not that. The world we live in is very segregated and separated, and I think that's by design, and mm-hmm. I think that's wrong, and I recognize that as a young kid, and when you drive down Main Street, one side of Nelson Road is one ethnic group, and another is on the other side of Nelson Road. You know, how is that? Um, it, it's by design, and um, I think most people go through their life in their group, and maybe their not aware of the other group that much they just don't pay attention that much or maybe they're scared of the other group a little bit or resentful of the other group and because i'm a musician i feel like i bypassed all that from the beginning right i remember hank Marr. he would talk to me about lots of stuff on breaks of the gigs and you know i never felt like he was looking at me he's like in any kind of funny way you know he just dealt with me like i was a young person who was eager to learn and and, uh, you know, I cherish those, those relationships I had in New York. It's, it's just continued on the same way. And so I, I think, you know, if everybody played the drums, you know, they would see the world in a different way than if they just stay on the computer or, or go to their day job and go home. And I, I think that, um, America has been on a, br- in, in, America is on the verge of some kind of breaking point again, and it's happened before. And it'll probably happen again. And I hope that at some point there's some some people some some group of people have the stomach to make things more equitable, not only for different races, but you know, the it's gotten so expensive to live in Columbus or Nashville or, or New York. I bought a place like six years ago, almost seven years ago, and you know, the the values of the places around my neighborhood in Brooklyn have doubled in that amount of time. Yeah. And I say, well, that's good for me, but it's really bad for everybody. I know. And, yeah. and I don't think there's any good answer for this. It's just really some running away of capital, you know, the capitalist system. And I don't think that we should all be paid a monthly salary. I, I don't think that's the answer, but it just has to be a little bit more equitable. So in the middle of the summer, I interviewed Otis Brown, the third, who is a brilliant uh, jazz drummer, a New York drummer. I know him best from playing with Esperanza Spalding, um, but he's played with uh, Joe Lovano and, and many, many others. Um, and towards the end of our interview, I, I just kind of, uh, you know, it was at this time of year when it was at the height of things. Um, and I just kind of asked him to speak about uh, his experience as a, a black man in the jazz world, a black man in, uh, you know, the music world. And 
he uh he pointed out how you know the music industry has always been uh just as wrought with uh systematic racism and bias as any other industry um and how even though you know many many indus industries are full of people with uh good intentions who are who are you know allies um those e even though those people are in power that's not always the same as you know having actual representation in those places of power um so otis also talked about how he's not deterred to you know speak his mind whether it's through the music or from the actual stage um but uh just you know kind of having a a, a greater honesty and authenticity um you know and and that in his connection a greater honesty and authenticity in his connection between the music he makes and uh you know the the racial justice that he seeks so check out otis brown the third i think the systemic thing definitely applies to this music as well too is that like the 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 people that control it don't often look like the people that create it mm -hmm. you know or that they are out making it happen you mm -hmm. know a lot of times that becomes you know because of the systemic thing of who runs the labels who are the big promoters who run the booking agencies right you know and who, who own they the gravitate who own the venues mm -hmm. and who they gravitate towards and implicitly or not mm -hmm. you know the, oftentimes you see a bias in that you know um and and in the drumming world too you know you see it a lot like who runs the magazines and that reflects who's on the covers all yeah. the time who hosts know? the podcasts who i know <laughs> 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 but you know so it it, it you know, it's a, what we do is a reflection of, of society and, and we kind of push it and, and try and change it. But, you know, all of that stuff applies here, too. And it's, you know, I don't know how it, I see how it, I know how it changes systemically in, in culture, in the world in general, especially in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's just been a problem getting there, but we know how to do it. We know how it can work. It's just people doing it. You know, I see how it changes there. I don't know how it changes in our industry, you know, like even, um, yeah, like labels have put out statements, but the history of these labels isn't always been equitable towards African-American people. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like you, they put out statements, but, you know, who's in power? How equitable is it? And, and you know, we're in an industry that, that's built not to be fair in a way. You know <laughs> yeah. I mean? Like it's, it's just made that way. And I think people are waking up to, or have woken up to that now. And, and, you know, if they haven't, they slowly are businesses, or, you know, but it's, it's that same thing that you see with businesses like, okay, thanks for your statement. But you know, what does your C-suite look like? What is your executive board? You know, yeah. what, what, <laughs> what, uh, who, what chief executive is it? How many are there? You know what I mean? So right. it's like, yeah, what are you going to do to fix that? And that that definitely applies, you know, applies across the board, but it's especially to music, you know, like it's it's been inherently um, made to profit off of African Americans a lot, like the you know, like mm -hmm. the foundation of a lot of American music, if not all, is that experience, you know, like yeah. I've been watching the Ken Burns country music special and how it came out of you know African American people slay. It's just like yeah. it's all there, so it's been made to. But in the same, you know, how is Elvis Presley more famous than, you know, whoever? Like, Chuck yeah, Berry. Like, <laughs> Chuck Berry. I, I couldn't think of the name. Exactly. <laughs> or a Little you know, Richard. Like, or a Little Richard. Yeah. Exactly. You know yeah. what I mean? So it's designed to be that way. And it's like, you know, it's I, I, I hope and I've seen this some that people are realizing, like, there's a difference between being non-racist and anti-racist. Yep. You know what I mean? Like, yep. oh. No, I'm not racist. I don't. But but if you're OK benefiting from the system that is inherently racist, mm -hmm. then you might as well be like yeah. if you're not working to break that down, then then you, you you might as well sign up with the people that that, you know, our proponents are advocates for that system. Right. You know what I mean? So it's like I think people are starting to understand like, oh, there's a difference between oh, I'm in this position and I'm not racist, but you got to that position because of a racist system mm -hmm. and it allows you to operate in a racist way just on its nature. Um, what are you going to do to change that? Right. Like what active steps are you going to take to change that? And, um, you know, I, I don't know how that happens in the music industry. I don't know how that happens at record labels. 
you know, even in the drum companies, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. like, uh, I had put out a bunch of stuff about Zildjian making a statement. And it was like, you know, like what, where are these companies at with all this going on? My friend Aaron Spears had done the same and, mm-hmm. you know, Zildjian reached out to the, and was like, you know, we're working on something and, you know, some, and then all the other companies started getting on board, but it's just like, I think you have to start realizing like, like everybody benefits from black culture, right? you know, like especially yeah. in music, you know? So if you're going to benefit from that all the time, like when, when things happen that affect that and affect the people that create it and that people that are your artists or that, you know, might not be your artists. Like you have to be involved in that part too. Mm -hmm. You can't just sit on the sideline and then be like, Oh, okay, come do this video for us at our place. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's not right. So, you know, I think this has brought, brought, the change that needs to happen to a lot of people's eyes, you yeah. know, and I think it's, it's, it's starting to happen. I don't know what that looks like step wise for the music industry. You right. know what I mean? Um, do you know, do you know but, what that looks like for you personally and for your family? Like for, for, you know, this time that we've all had to just sit around and think like, have you, mm-hmm. have you thought about different ways that um, you're going to uh, go back out into the world <laughs> in your, right. in I your mean, industry? Yeah, I, I've never been one to, to to shy away from you know speaking or ta- or playing or writing songs and and talking about things at my shows and uh, you know, but I I feel like a I've always felt a responsibility to that you know like you know there's the Nina Simone quote that talks about the art should reflect the times you're in like you know in my right. opinion it's always been like if you're not doing that like what are you doing mm-hmm. you know if this is everything's going on around you you can't ignore it. Um, so yeah, I, but you know, I feel like there's there's going to be a lot of like people having less tolerance for nonsense from you know people that are in power in in, right. in in our music. You know what I mean? Like, there's no reason why I why do I why is my guarantee this and I know your guarantee for this other person was this or why are you telling me I can only do one night and I saw you do you know, when I'll have the same draw, like this, I think I've never shied away from that kind of stuff, but mm-hmm. I, I feel like now even more for myself and everybody, there's going to be more um, speaking up in a way like, you know, right. And like I think there'll be, isn't cool. yeah, like more, more speaking up in that way, but also um, more speaking up from the stage, like you were talking about. Exactly. Oh, for sure. For yeah. sure. I mean, I, the, you know, there's a song that, um, it's funny, man. So I I haven't talked about this, but I'm working on a new record and I started oh, cool. it probably 17, 2017. And um, at the time, the record is called Deferred Dreams and Radio Rahim. So Radio Rahim was the, co- the guy killed by the cops and, and do the right thing. Spike Lee's movie mm-hmm. Deferred Dreams is a poem by Langston Hughes. Um, but it's literally... There's a song for the Charleston Nine who the anniversary is today that I talked about and um, you know, Jimmy Green's there's a song for Jimmy's daughter. There's a you know, but it was like I've always wanted to make music that showed that Keon Howard is in the band. He had a song called um MB Lament. He's from Ferguson, so he mm. wrote a song for Michael Brown that yeah. every time we played live, I would talk about and talk about the inspiration. And I I could see it would make people uncomfortable, but whatever. You yeah. know what I mean? Like I just I didn't care. Um but yeah, I think there's a there's going to be a lot more of that, you know, and 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 it's going to be unavoidable because like even without talking about it, like people's music, um, people are going to make music that reflect the times we're in, and it's just you know it's it's going to be um, you're not going to be able to not talk about it, right? You know, so from the stage or whatever, or, you know, I've had people come. Um, I remember after the time I, talk, I talked about playing that song and a lady, a white woman came up to me after the show and was like, yeah, I don't, I don't think you should describe what happened that way and blah, blah, blah. And I was just like, yeah, I'm sorry, but that's how I see it. And that's how I feel mm-hmm. it happened, you know? And uh, I think I said something like, and I was being sarcastic and I was like, you know, like, I said it was dedicated to Michael Brown and all of like the other radio Raheems that, you know, that seemed to have like a, uncanny knack for being killed by police you know and i said that during the show and she was just like yeah i just wouldn't say that you guys have an uncanny knack for being killed by and i was like you know i hope you didn't take that literally but you know that when i talk about it i get upset and this that was definitely sarcastic you know but it's just like things like that you know that 
I don't think people are going to have much care for how comfortable people are yeah. anymore. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that that's what I think one of the big differences will be going forward. Mm -hmm. And hopefully uh, people like that woman um, will be, uh, you know, less likely to feel the need to weigh in. <laughs> exactly. Or feel offended or feel, you know, like just, just take it for what it is and, and, you know, it could it would have been better if she was like, yeah, I understand how you feel like this is, you know, it's terrible, but whatever. Right, you know what I mean? Right. But there's a way just listen, to, like just listen and not always, you know, not mm -hmm. be offended and re argumentative and just accept, you know, this is something I'm learning in, in my life in general for me is like just accept when you're wrong, uh, apologize and try and fix it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just what it is. Right. And, it, you know, you just have to recognize that and be willing to do so. Uh, next, we want to talk about uh, an encore presentation that we did of uh, the Black Drummers of Nashville Roundtable. I, I can't remember how many years ago that we did this, but I remember uh, when this, I don't know, earlier this year, and, and uh, Zach, you reached out to me, and you're like, hey, can we repost this episode? And, and I... It just it was a great idea just just to go back and 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 revisit that roundtable and the conversation and the energy that those guys brought to the podcast. So I'm I'm really proud of that episode. I want to thank Keo, even though I had nothing to do with it. Well, <laughs> <laughs> in this clip, Derek Phillips talks about, and this was a time when he was working with Hank Williams, and uh, you know it's interesting. He he, he talks about being probably the only black person with a, within a five mile radius at some of these gigs that he was doing when he was working with Hank Williams at the time. And, and just kind of the pressure and the responsibility of being possibly one of the only black people that the audience experiences or sees for them in a positive light, you know, in person with their hero. And, um, it, it, I don't know. The, the whole episode is amazing. It's fun. It's, it's, it's great. Check this clip out from the Black Drummers of Nashville Roundtable. And this, is, this clip features Derek Phillips. So just to remind folks, this roundtable featured uh, Keo Stroud, Hubert Payne, Derek Phillips, Jeremy Roberson, and Marcus Finney. Um, and I believe all five of those guys have uh, have done individual interviews with us, correct? That's correct. Yeah, they each have their right. own interviews. So this, uh, yeah, this was from our encore presentation with those five guys, the Black Drummers of Nashville Roundtable. Growing up on the West Coast, you have a little apprehension to the South if you don't if you're mm -hmm. not from there. Yeah. So so I was all, I was a little hesitant to even move here because. My thinking as a way, you know, sometimes it'd be a little elitist, but you think as a California, you got it all figured out. And we're all, you know, we, we love everybody. And so my picture of the South was like, you know, Civil War and Confederate flags. Yeah, yeah, so it's like, yeah. why would I want to live there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <clears throat> so I'm a little, I have a little aversion to homogeny, homo mm -hmm. you know, things being everyone's the same. Mm -hmm. So whether it's Detroit, Shelbyville, Tennessee, wherever. Like, I like diversity just because that's what I know. Yeah. So so coming here again, I was a little concerned, but you know, but I wasn't against playing country mm -hmm. music. It was just that I just I wanted to I want to do it all. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when I got here, and it's, I'm grateful that I've had the opportunities and work with the people I've worked with, and uh, like like kind of what you're saying, the group thing, like playing with Hank is really cool because from a music perspective because he definitely has a lot of influence from a bunch of different music. Like for me, it's like playing, I mean, one aspect is like playing a straight up rock gig, one aspect is like playing an R&B gig, and then, I was, and then a straight up country. And so, and it's all about, you know, to me, I just I just want to groove. I just mm -hmm. love a groove. I mean, whether it's a train beat, right? you know, right. James <laughs> Gadsden groove, yeah. a class Stubblefield <laughs> groove, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. Will Calhoun, I mean, I, I just like to groove. And so, that so I'm th thankful that I get to. I don't feel like I'm out of character when I'm playing with when I'm playing country music because I just want to groove like you like you guys were both saying like just make it feel right. Yeah, that's it. Man. So, but, <clears throat> but the experience aside from music is fascinating because kind of what you're saying like 
when I go to a when I'm at a hang gig, <laughs> chances are I might be the only black person in, in the in a five mile radius. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's right. right. Outside of maybe a few people working the arena, like and me. Do, yeah, yeah, yeah. Another black, another black drummer at the festival. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I, that's what like, I call it. Man. We, we ran it right. <laughs> it's, like, it's like a bad exactly. version of Where's Waldo. Oh, yeah. right, right, I got right, the audience right. and there's Keto. Right, exactly. Where's <laughs> man, Keto? Exactly. They ain't gave me all access pass, man. So I get to just come to the shows. Right? As you should. Wow. As you should. should. As you should. Absolutely. You doubled the, you doubled yeah. the population. I doubled the population. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just fight. by being there. Yeah. Just yeah. By being there. Yeah. <laughs> but the thing that really checked me is that at first glance, like, you know, shoot, man, at a hand gig, I've seen more Confederate flags in mm. in one place than ever. And mm-hmm. so it really forced me to check me. Is like, I, because initially I'm like, man, I, can I really do this? I don't, I'm tired of being the only one. Like, I, mm. I grew up in the suburbs, man. The chances are I was the only black kid in my class for bulk of my career, bulk of my schooling. Mm-hmm. So I was like, this sucks, man. I'm tired of being the only one. Why did I be the only one? Then I realized that maybe I'm here because I might be the only black person they see mm-hmm. yes. in person. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So what? It's true. So, so at in first, a positive light. Yeah. In a positive light. In yeah. a positive light. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly, in a positive way, absolutely. So it, that, that is a burden to carry, but but I have to be willing to carry it too. Yeah. And I've had people actually walk up to me like, "What's it like?" It's like specifically saying that, "What's it like to be Hank's black drummer?" Like I remember, dude, we did this one show my first year with him, and we had these um, ambient mics that were like right, um, right on the stage, pointing at the audience, and so it basically at people's faces, so almost like vocal mics. Were. And I remember we finished playing for about fifteen twenty minutes, and then we take a break. And then Hank does his acoustic set, so we all glee. So I'm on this high rise behind Hank. I stand up so everyone can see me, and I walk down off my rise. And I heard in my ears someone say, "Hey, did you see that black drummer up there?" <laughs> like, I don't know, it's funny. Like, I mean, she probably meant as a compliment. Yeah, yeah. But even still, it's like the fact that that's. You know that I have to be cognizant of that. Like, yeah, I'm gonna right. get noticed yeah. all the yeah. freaking time. Yeah. 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 So, oh, they watch it. Don't yeah, they're constantly yeah, watching. They watch so, it. and they went, "Look at him. That, that's Keo." <laughs> <laughs> That's why we're here, guys. Yeah. Every black yeah. drummer in Nashville is it me. I, <laughs> I went, man, now I'm seeing why history. you want to do this. So our second prize is uh, what we're calling a kick package. Um, we're welcoming another new sponsor, which is uh, Gibraltar Hardware. Super excited to have them along for the ride. And they have provided a uh, Gibraltar Tour Class kick pedal. Uh, as part of our second prize, uh, we're also throwing into, into this package uh, another kicker, kick drum muffling system, and some uh, Aquarian drum kit tools. Check this out. On this 13-inch floor tom, uh, <laughs> sorry, 13-inch so tom. Hold up. hold up, second second prize doesn't have booty shakers in it. It does. It does? Guess what? <laughs> we're throwing it in. <laughs> Little Booty Shaker's second prize right here. That's pulling an audible on me. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, that took this mid-70s Ludwig 13-inch Tom, just open it up. It's it's amazing. So I don't have to mess with, uh, you know, rims mounts or anything like that, but I've got these mini booty shakers on this old Thomas snare drum stand. That's and so cool. It's uh, It's amazing. It's great. Awesome. So, and and you know, like like when we talk to the guys at TNR, um, you know, it's not d- about sustain; it's about tone. You know, it's about yeah. like really finding all the sweet sounds that your drums have. So, this is great. It's been awesome. Cool. Yeah, little booty shakers for everybody. Um, we're like Oprah here, man. And you get <laughs> you get a little booty you shakers. Little bo- Hey, and, and one last thing on the third prize, you get the little booty shakers, you get the big booty shakers, and we've got all those Aquarian, some the drum kit tools uh, we're going to throw in there too. So keep in mind, first, second, and third prize, we've got the tone package for the first prize, the kick package for the second prize, and we've got some uh, runner-up prizes for third. So guys, real easy to participate. So uh, another thing that, that we've all been sort of exploring um, during this time of, of lockdown and quarantine and, and solitude is, I think, uh, really trying to uh, get our technique together or back together 
um, or, you know, whatever, whatever, uh, you know, physical sort of issue or concept you've wanted to explore or fix. Um, this has certainly given us a lot of time to do that. Um, and this year we, we landed, uh, two of the biggest guests we've ever had on the show, uh, Todd Zuckerman and Dave Weckl. Um, Matt interviewed Todd, I interviewed Dave, um, and uh, they both, uh, you know, not surprisingly, had really, really great things to say um, about sort of the journey they've been on with with technique and physicality and movement. Um, so, uh, what did uh, what did Todd have to say in his interview? What are you What are you going to set up here? Well, uh, you know, the the big takeaway for him is is relaxation. You know, it, it mentally and physically relaxing. And I I can't tell you how the timing of this interview with Todd just couldn't have come at a better time uh, for me in my life. And, and it's, it's just been a big focus recently. I mean, like you said, man, having Todd, it was such a big deal. And, and I wasn't even sure if it was going to happen or not. I mean, he's such a busy guy. He was very cordial in our exchange. But then when we got on the phone to, t to actually make the plan, he's like, man, listen, I'm slammed. I haven't seen my kid. I want to spend time with my family. I mean, I was like, whoa, I don't know if this, you know, I said, that's great, please. If you don't have time, no problem. But he's like, okay, I'll do it. And I'm just like, I was so nervous about talking to him because I'm like, he doesn't want to talk to me. He doesn't <laughs> want to do this. Um, but he was hilarious. He was so he was sweet. Great. Yeah. Uh, uh, so generous with his time, as all of our guests have been, uh, just surprisingly sweet. And um, so... Uh, in talking about technique, in talking about relaxation, mentally, physically, here's a quote from him. If you can change your grip, you will change your life. And uh, just check this clip out. It's great. So here's Todd Zuckerman. Uh, relaxation is so much the key to uh, everything, mental relaxation and physical relaxation. So there's certain elements that uh, a lot of people screw themselves up with, clouding their their judgment, clouding uh, their thought process with fear and anxiety that keeps them from connecting with the true power of music and thus never becoming your authentic self and who you are supposed to be on this instrument. And it's very, very simple. There's some techniques that, you know, the audience is always on your side. And it sounds nice and it sounds trite uh, and cliche, but, it, but it's true. And I go through a process with everyone in the room that, that proves this um, through their own fear. Uh, and then once we've kind of talked about some different mental relaxation techniques and, and how and kind of showing them what reality is when you play the instrument, um, then we deal with the physical relaxation because I've found in, in my teaching, since I've been teaching privately more and taking part in, in drum camps like, you know, drum fantasy camp and, you know, I did, did uh, a couple in Europe. It doesn't matter where you are, Prague, Nashville, Tulsa, Orange County, it doesn't matter where you are. It, 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 90 to 95% of drummers are, are doing things with their physicality, with their grip that are keeping them from ever busting on to the next level. Um, they're doing things to keeping them from ever being able to play a fast three note uh, ride cymbal pattern, whether it's swing time, you know, jazz beat or, you know, one and two and or one and a two and a three yeah. or fast 16th notes on the hi-hat because they've played a certain way that was either directed to them by a junior high band director who was a clarinet player or they got caught up in the drumline thing and that's fine for drumline but that style of technique is non-applicable on the drum set. Mm. Mm -hmm. it's not applicable. Just like you have Segovia on a nylon string acoustic guitar and you have Slash on a black Les Paul. There are six strings, but the technique to do what the, each is doing are, are different. Right. Uh, or they were self-taught. And you picked up a pair of sticks and you nestle the stick in that big second knuckle in your first finger 
and you're off to the races, never being able to achieve your dreams. Yeah. So, so in, in, in short, drummers have always been my favorite people. They've always been my best friends from the time I was, you know, a little kid till now. And your drum friends, if you're lucky to have, um, a few close lifelong drum friends, they're, they're in a category of very special friends. Yeah. And so this is sort of my, uh, crusade to help my drumming brothers and sisters get on the right track. Because if you can change your grip, you will change your life. If you change your grip and you have a relaxed grip with a space between your thumb and, and first finger, that is the keys to the universe to now being able to achieve in time everything that you've wanted to achieve and never been able to. And then if you couple that with being relaxed in your mind and not putting up your own roadblocks, then you're on your way to being who you're supposed to be on this instrument. So getting to interview Dave Weckl was uh, obviously a, a big day for me. It's uh, <laughs> something I, I never really thought would happen. And I got to say that like you, Matt, made it happen. Um, you you did all the logistics and then you kind of came to me and you were like, you want to interview Dave Weckl? Like, <laughs> Here's a side note, man. One thing that I appreciate about, appreciate about our partnership is just kind of our the, the different places where we come from. Experience. I mean, I, I hate to use the word expertise, but like we just have different experiences. We have similar, right. but um, this was such an important interview. This was such a big deal for us. And um, I just wanted all your knowledge of jazz history and, and technique and stuff like that. It just, it just needed to be treated with kid gloves and you did a great job. <laughs> Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, and you know, I was, I was super intimidated by, by just the prospect of, of interviewing Weckl. And, um, you know, like you said about Zuckerman, he's a total sweetheart. He was super gracious, uh, just from, from start to finish. Um, but you know, leading up to the interview, I was thinking about like, he was, you know, Weckl was one of my guys sort of like early on when I was in college. Um, but I kind of moved past him, um, and, you know, went on to other influences, uh, and, and, you know, his influence kind of faded in the background. Um, but leading up to this interview, like I dug into some videos and some recordings of his and was just reminded all over again, uh, like, I mean, as Christopher Alice put it, Dave Weckl is a peerless drummer like he is wow. just one of a kind and and whether his thing is something you're into or not uh you just you you can't deny um uh just the 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 prowess and the um i mean he's a master he's he's just an, he's one of the masters um so so getting to interview with him was was uh exciting and intimidating and and all this stuff but one of the things i noticed um uh, like looking at his old videos versus his new videos was just the difference in him physically. Um, so he, you know, I asked him about that and he uh, just talked about how he completely changed his physical approach without changing the essence of his playing and his music. Um, and he also talks about kind of the physical ways you can manifest the emotional energy of music. This is something he found himself doing in, in his younger years. Um, and how that, like that physical manifestation of what you think the emotional energy of the music is, doesn't always serve you musically or physically. And that's kind of what he had to address. Um, so again, this was a huge day for, for me and for us. Um, grateful to you, Matt, for, for making it happen and check out Dave Weckl. In years past, and you know, in that era, whatever it was in the mid '90s, up to then, your your movement was it seemed to have more violence in it, right? It was just faster and more aggressive. And I watched this recent video, and you, of course, still sound exactly like you, but just the movement had completely smoothed out, um, and you seemed like even though you weren't playing any slower, you just seemed to be moving slower. Um, so I'm. I'd be fascinated to hear about just the journey you've been on uh, with the physical aspect of your playing. Well, Zach, let me tell you, um, <laughs> it's interesting you should use the word violence. Uh, I'm, I'm definitely not a violent guy, but right. <laughs> but I remember um, you know, a couple things. 
I've always been into the energy aspect, the higher en- energy, you know, players, you know, and uh, it's why I've always, I always, you know, was attracted to to players like that, like mm-hmm. Vinny and and Buddy and you know and Gad yeah. uh, back in the day, and uh, and Peter Erskine. Now, yeah. when I was a kid, you know, the only way I saw these guys. You know, Buddy Rich, I saw a few times live um, coming through St. Louis, usually from a great distance. But I remember, you know, Erskine coming through with with um, with Maynard Ferguson. Mm-hmm. And I swear to God, he was jumping up and down on the, on the throne. <laughs> there was just so much energy. And then, you know, I saw Gad for the first time in 79 when I moved to New York and live. And I actually still have that recording, actually. Um, it was him with Steps before it was called Steps Ahead, and I, God, it was just absolutely burning, just yeah, completely. I mean, he literally crazy. is jumping up and down, like yeah, to this and day. I mean, it's just... And the actions, the action, you know, and and there's even some videos. If you go pull up some videos of Steve from you know the 70s and early 80s, I mean, man, there was so much physical stuff. So I was, I was kind of pattering, pattering, pat, patterning myself. <laughs> After these guys, because they were my favorite players, you know, mm-hmm. and and then I remember Jay and I, Jay Oliver, my, you know, we because we'd study all this stuff and we, you know, it's like, what, man, why doesn't it sound, you know, it's not popping, it doesn't have this thing, and 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 you know, we started to um, we started to associate the word anger with with how it came across, you know, it's like. Mm-hmm. And sometimes if you're angry about something, if you play angry, there's like this whole energy, you know, there's this whole thing. Um, And so it's not that I was angry a lot, but I had this frame of mind that I was, I, in order to get across the emotional aspect, I was, I was thinking that the more physical it looked and the more, you know, of that energy that I put into what I was playing was, was going to come across. So, and in some instances it did, uh, but I look back at it now and I cringe, you know, I just, I watch videos of myself and I'm going, what am I doing? You know, it's like, <laughs> I am just playing so hard, you know, and, and hitting hard and, and my, you know, my hands are, you know, paying for it today. I mean, it's a, uh, you know, thankfully I, I, met Freddie and started studying with him and completely changed the approach in the mid nineties and, um, and probably saved my career in the process because, mm-hmm. uh, cause I was headed down a path where, you know, uh, hands and shoulders and neck and all the stuff was just, you know, starting to really, you know, uh, you know, get beat up. Right. It's funny you mentioned that because one of the main differences I noticed from the old video to the new video was from the neck up. Um, yeah. because on the old stuff, like there's a lot of head movement, it's jerking around and there's just a lot of tension in your face sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas recently it's just very sort of neutral, serene, you know, yeah. <laughs> it must, it must feel yeah. better. It's boring is another word. If you're watching, it's like, <laughs> Jesus Christ. I, now I look at myself and go, come on, man, do something, you know, it's, yeah. like, it's like, but the, here's the point, you know, the point is, is that, is that it, it was a lot of work back then. Mm-hmm. I was making playing drums really difficult for myself. Uh, and you mentioned the setup before, you know, my online school, it's like there's a whole course set up, you know, just to just to pay attention to how you're uh, setting up so that you're not moving your body in an unnatural way to hit a drum. Yeah. Move your body, move the drum, not your body. OK, mm-hmm. put it in a position that that correlates with you know, a natural movement that you're not stressing, uh, any part of the body to, to make a stroke or make, you know, anything happen. So all of that has to do with heights and angles. And then there's the whole approach concept of, uh, of how you're holding the stick Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, Peter and Steve and, you know, they, they, I think Peter still does play a bit back on his left hand stick traditional, um, That is, I mean, Steve is playing more more mass grip these days, but um, but but I think when he's when still when he plays traditional, he's a little bit back on the on the end. And I used to I used to do that too. I subscribed to it because you know, I could get a really good back beat that way. But you know when you actually think about it from from a 
a, a, a physics point of view as far as action, reaction, principle, bounce, rebound, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if your stick is not balanced in your hand, which is going to not be holding it from the back, it isn't going to bounce. And so that means you got to do all the work. And that's how I was playing back then. Right. There just wasn't a whole lot of rebound going on. There wasn't a whole lot of the sticks doing the work for me back then. And that was Freddie's that was Freddie's whole mantra. It was like, let the sticks do the work. Get out of the way. You know? mm -hmm. And um, and so when when that happened, uh, and and that approach happened, where I just went through this 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 whole kind of starting over thing with the setup, and really thinking about it from that point of view, and then applying also you know more the middle of the hand uh, you know fulcrum focus point with thumb and middle finger versus front of the hand priority. Mm -hmm. uh, everything changed, man. Everything changed. Everything got easier, every, you know, and I, I was actually getting more volume than I was before and more, more big, a bigger sound. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, cause when you hold the sticks tight and you're, and you're putting a lot of physical effort into it, you're hitting hard, the, that initial transient is going to be, you know, hard. It's going to, it's going to sound yeah almost compressed naturally because yep. that's what you are doing. You're, 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 you're choking the stick before it ever hurt, hits anything. So the sound that you're creating is going to be choked and it might have a, a, a lot of impact, but it's going to sound a little bit on the small side, small and tight. Right. And, um, and plus you're just killing yourself. You know, it's the older you get, you know, it's, uh, it's, you know, I just, I just turned 60 in January and I'm, Good for you. I'm, ba I feel actually better playing, these days than I did when I was in my late thirties in for, into my forties, you know? Wow. So, and I don't get the cramping anymore. I've learned how to understand my limits and I've learned how to make the music. I want, this is the most important aspect. It's, it's not about how you look when you play the drums, you know, it's not about that physical input so much. It's, it's about what does the music sound like? What, are, what are you doing to support the music as a drummer? And that, that's what's going to get you hired, you know, and right. it's, uh, more than anything else and rehired. I want to talk about Steve Gould. Uh, he was introduced to us uh, by a friend here in Nashville that I have yet to interview. Um, just a, a, a super humble, uh, wonderful drummer. And he introduced me to Steve Gould and uh, Steve just there's so much gold in this conversation. Gould Gold? Gould Gold. Uh, we're going to market that, trademark. <laughs> I, you know, the ironic thing is, is when I, you know, I'm doing some research, I'm digging in, finding out, you know, play with Sarah Borales, uh, runs this, he's a music director for this humongous church out in Arizona, tons of responsibility. One of the things that he talks about in, in, in this clip, again, the, the whole conversation is so much to take away. But uh, I loved this. Again, I just dropped the needle and found this, and I'm like, I love this. I love this. And, and it, it talks about learning to perform at a professional level even when your mix is bad or your gear is less than ideal. The reason I, I wanted to bring this clip in is that it's just not discussed enough, and it's so important. Like at a, to work, If you want to work at a pro level, and even as a professional, you have to be reminded because not not every gig is going to be the perfect mix or have the perfect gear or have your symbols or have whatever. You have to deliver. So um, the clip speaks for itself. So check that out. Uh, here's Steve Gould. If you're, at a, if you're doing these gigs where the, the, the drum sound is really great and fat and all these things, the, and then you go to a songwriter gig or you do an acoustic gig like, or a tour like you're doing and it's just monitors. I mean, I understand you've got the acoustic thing going on. But there's been times that I've gone in and played a, a gig and like the drum mix isn't good or or, or there's no in-ear mix and, and it, it freaks me out. You need to be able to perform at a high level no matter what the situation. Yeah, man. I that <laughs> could not agree more. In fact, one of my, I, I won't call it a pet peeve because uh, that's too strong of a term, but like something that irritates me is when I'm working with an artist or even just watching an artist do their sound check. I'm not even working for them. I was, maybe we're just playing the same bill or whatever. And they're doing sound check and, and they're getting real, real picky about, about their monitors and, mm -hmm. and they're not very good. Like, like the artists themselves, like mm -hmm. not a great, not a great player. What 
what are you doing being so picky about your monitors? Uh, maybe you should, <laughs> maybe you should practice more. <laughs> this is me getting, getting on a little bit of a soapbox, but like I, I'm very passionate about, about not blaming stuff for like, yeah. Yeah. Oh, and, and I regularly see drummers, musicians, uh, you know, songwriters, band leaders, or just bass players or whatever, like kind of blaming their mix when something goes wrong. And man, I never, uh, I don't ever see the mix actually being at fault in those situations. When stuff goes wrong, it's usually the musician themselves making mistakes or just not, uh, thinking clearly or not, not being sharp as opposed to the mix Boy, the mix really cost us an issue here. Like that almost never happens. Uh, the, w- the church that I work at, the uh, my job as a lead music director at this mega church is to oversee all the band members at all of our locations. The church has ten different locations, and I'm I'm the guy responsible for booking the bands and kind of overseeing all those musicians. Mm-hmm. And uh, as a result, we will bring in a couple times a year, like a, a clinician, like a guest, uh, an, like a friend of mine from somewhere around the country to come in and do a masterclass workshop for all of our players. And a few years ago, my buddy Cody Fry, do you know him? He lives in Nashville. I do not. Uh, Cody is an f- absolute force. He's uh, a lot younger than me and you. Like he's, I think he's still in his twenties, maybe mid twenties. Uh, just a really, really talented musician. I worked with him in Ben Rector's band for a while. And I, I play a lot of Cody's solo music now. He came in and gave a masterclass for our team, and one of the one of the things he said was this exact point, which is that your your mix is not ever the reason that you're making a mistake. Mm. There there are certainly some helpful things about a good mix, one of them being inspiration. But don't blame your mix. In fact, try like maybe set up some bad mixes for yourself on occasion, just to show yourself that you can do it. Yeah, even even when the mix is bad. And I was so pumped to hear him say this, especially in the presence of the whole team, like all my musicians are all the musicians that we, you know, we, we use in the church. They're all there. They're all listening to him say that I can see them all kind of like looking at each other. It's like, ha, now, now you guys are not going to be able to get away with blaming your mistakes on your mixes anymore. Cause here's Cody telling everybody that that's not how it works in the, in the, in the pro world. And yeah, man, that, uh, wow. That's a, I'm, I'm getting excited over here because that's such an important topic to me. <laughs> just, just in the, in the, in the realm of not blaming, yeah, not, not blaming mistakes on anything other than my own prep, preparation level, my own skill set. Uh, the, the, the monitor, the in-ear mix has become a regular, I've, I've observed the inner mix has become a regular scapegoat for musicians who maybe have no business blaming their mix. You have to rise above a crappy mix. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that's what a professional does. An am- an amateur, a sign of an amateur is like, ah, if, if the situation isn't perfect, then I can't do it. Pros are there to just like, whatever the situation is, I'll do it. I think that's the, the nucleus of this discussion we're having about mix. It's like, okay, your mix isn't perfect. The the drums, the backline kit that you use and using on the one-off isn't ideal. Or maybe there's some, like you forgot your symbols, so you had to borrow somebody else's symbols or you're using different sticks than you usually, but it's like, whatever. It doesn't matter. Like you still have to perform at a professional level because that's what a professional does. Yeah, and the singer doesn't care. The artist, whoever, the audience yeah. certainly doesn't care. Totally, totally, man. Uh, yeah, that's a that's a big deal to me. Uh, so the the last clip we want to play for you uh, under our technique and performance is uh, a guest we had, Jimmy Paxson who I discovered watching him with the Dixie Chicks. He's just an amazing drummer, but his he's got there's a lot more history to him. I encourage you to check out Jimmy Paxson uh, and then him talking about his father who was an amazing drummer who taught at um he taught in Philadelphia at the University of the Arts. And um Jimmy's a great storyteller and a great drummer, but in this clip um, he's talking about subbing for his dad at the School of the Arts, and um, he gets into an analogy of how to hold the stick, and that's why I put it in this thing. But more importantly, it's hilarious. It's just it's it's an amazingly funny clip. So check this out just to finish up our uh, segment on technique and performance. Here's a clip from Jimmy Paxson. 
you know, my father, when he was ill, sent me into the U of Arts to, to teach. And I had a lot of these private students. And um, I told my dad, he was asking me, he was in the hospital. And he was like, how's it going over there? And I go, it's going all right, dad. You know, some of these kids, like, they squeeze the stick so hard that they can't get a sound out of the drum. Yeah. And my father, in his very matter-of-fact ways, goes, yeah, man, we'll... Uh, I remember he was like the toothpick. He was obsessed with his fucking teeth towards the end. And he goes, yeah, man, well, uh, ask them if they have dogs. <laughs> and, you know, the trained reaction to my father, which I learned because he always had a point and a weird way around it. I go, I would never say, why dogs? You know, I would, I just agreed. I went, <laughs> okay. Okay. You know, agree. For, uh, uh, yes. Be, you know, before, no, just like, yeah, Okay. Okay, yeah. Well, Dad, I'm just curious, though. Like, why do you want me to ask them if they have dogs? And he goes, he goes, well, man, you know, if they have a dog, you know, chances are they take the dog for a walk. Dog needs to take a shit. <laughs> I go, yeah. And he goes, well, and he's crumbling up a piece of paper at this point, you know, crumbling it. And he goes, and he lays it on the table in front of him. He goes, you know, we'll ask them when the dog takes a shit and he goes and picks up the paper and he goes, do they pick it up as gently as possible <laughs> as to not crush the shit? <laughs> or do they pick up the shit and squeeze it really fucking hard? <laughs> and I started laughing and he goes, tell them they pick up the sticks to pick up the sticks the same way they pick up the dog's shit. <laughs> and dude, it worked. Of course, I'm never, you're never going to forget that. It's amazing. And it really, I mean, I'm, I'm grateful that I learned all this stuff from my father, you know. I don't have him around anymore as a, as a source of information, so all I have to go on is the stories. And, like, he left me a great box of CDs, which he claims if you line everything in there, you'll be a great jazz drummer, you know. But, um, you know, it's, there's, there's that, you know. You have to put in the time, and, and really, I mean... If somebody comes forth with a problem, you at least got to know what the problem is, you know, and then have some creative way of explaining it, which, as just mentioned here, my father had very colorful ways of uh, describing it in a way that you wouldn't forget. You know what I mean? We've talked quite a bit in the past uh, with various guests about the, the different ways that um, sort of real life can barge in on your music career, um, whether that's an illness or an injury or uh, the death of a loved one. Um, and this year, uh, you know, real life kind of barged in on all of us <laughs> in a, in a really unwelcome way. Um, so in this, uh, in this next kind of set of clips, um, we're going to hear from a few people who, who just have, uh, you know, what we feel are interesting and, and useful takes on, um, you know, ways that we're all going through that ways that we're processing that. Um, and the first one, uh, we're going to hear from is Beth Goodfellow. Um, she is an L.A. drummer, vocalist, percussionist, and uh, I, I got her on the podcast because early on in the in the pandemic, she was asking, uh, you know, big questions about the convergence of COVID and music. Um, some of those questions have been at least partially answered in the months since. Um, but I think the conversation we had in July is still very much ongoing amongst musicians. Um, there's some good news recently. She, she mentioned the, uh, National Independent Venue Association and the, the Save Our Stages bill. Um, like I said, she was kind of all over this stuff six months ago, but, uh, that bill just passed as part of the new relief package. Um, so that's good news for us. Um, but, uh, I just thought it was important to kind of, uh, re-feature what, uh, what Beth had to say on, uh, on some of these COVID related issues as it pertains to us musicians. Most of us aren't working mm -hmm. at all right now. And so, and when we go back to work, naturally our concern is going to be, is it safe? Mm -hmm. And then the doors open, like, is it safe? You know, X, Y, and Z, is that going to happen on, on stage? How do you ensure that that's going to happen? How do you ensure that it's going to be safe? And at the same time, what about these other things that have been inconsistent and um, maybe we could be doing a little bit better on? Um, right. And in, just in terms of like the pay aspect alone, um, you know, the, the primary concern 
used to be is is the pay fair is it equitable whether you do whether you're doing a live gig mm. or or um a recording thing like a streaming thing like that was the primary question so is is that question going to be a, a casualty of the new question of is it safe you know are venues or um mm. streaming services or the powers that be going to say uh well like how how bad do you want to play it is safe so you know Mm. How about what, um, like, do you, can we expect to, you know, can we expect to get paid what we were getting paid before COVID, whether it's a tour or a bar gig or a wedding gig or, and I think the answer is yes, but like, how do we do that? <laughs> you know, because I think a lot right. of, a lot of people are going to say, you know, this is a new world. The old rules are gone and, uh, you know, there is just not as much money to go around for musicians anymore. Hmm. Whenever somebody tells me there's not enough money, <laughs> I'm like, really, though? <laughs> right. Because yeah. there's a lot of, like, money that just went to all these billionaires and, yeah. you know, these airlines and these, I mean, there's there's money. Mm -hmm. There's money in this industry. There's so much money. Yeah. Um, th there's only three major labels, and they kind of, like, control a lot of things, and there's a lot of... You know, Spotify, what, just like is is one of like the, the most successful um, like uh, tech companies ever. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Like, I don't know. Is it is it 500 something? Not million, billion. I don't know. But yeah, I would believe it. Yeah. So there's there's money in this industry or people wouldn't be frantically like trying to figure out how to keep it going. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the is is the question of equitable pay going to be a casualty of the safety conversation i mean i i would argue that like post covid we're going like i wouldn't work i wouldn't play a wedding gig for like the same rate that i used to simply because there's a greater risk involved now mm -hmm. yeah and um i don't know like you, yeah you're always going to you can't you can't like organize every laborer like there are going to be i think it's like maybe what i'm thinking about is like there are going to be people who cross the figurative picket line um and go play the covid infested wedding for a <laughs> hundred bucks yeah. <laughs> yeah i mean i think what we're trying to do is like set professional standards for like prof like working professional working drummers mm -hmm. like like i played a video the other day um and the original gig call was oh we're going to be in this production studio um there's going to be three of us on stage and there's going to be four you know film crew and um we're all going to be wearing masks and mm -hmm. i was like okay well like what's the space like what's the deal is there a window like can, can we get some air circulation you know and at that point i hadn't played in like two or three months right. and i was dying dying to play right like i speak that language better than i speak the English language, <laughs> you know, like I, I need to be able to like communicate that way. And so I was like, how can I make this happen? Like, I would love to do this gig. Um, but then I got a video of the, the, um, room and it was so tiny and, and it just didn't seem safe to me. So I turned it down mm -hmm. and then, um, it was moved outside. The shoot was moved outside and, um, at night so that they could use the lights and stuff. And that there was a promise, okay, masks, everyone's going to be wearing masks and we'll be six feet apart. And then, um, and I was like, that, that feels safe to me. Mm -hmm. I'm down to do this. Um, of course, like halfway through the shoot, it was like, can you do a, a take without the masks? Because we don't, you know, that we don't want aesthetically, it's not as nice as having I was like, man, like this is going to be interesting moving forward because we agreed on one thing, but it was a handshake deal. Yep. And now in the moment we're being pressured to do something different than we agreed upon. And if I don't, you know, go through with what they're asking, right. Then I'll, you know, maybe it won't be called back again. Right. Or... And that's nothing new. That proposition is as old as the music industry itself, but now Absolutely. it's, it's about fucking COVID. It's not about when you eat, you know, 
<laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> it's, For real. It's not about whether you do two sets versus three or whatever. It's about whether or not you might catch fucking COVID. Right. Exactly. And we shouldn't have to be in these conversations by ourselves. And I like, yeah, I, I, I hope that there's a way for musicians to like standardize a set of like best practices on our own behalf mm -hmm. somehow. Yeah. Um, but like whether we do it regionally or whether we do it like nationwide, I right, don't know. But right. I'm realizing now that it, you know, th COVID questions might not mm -hmm. be as, as tough of a call for a lot of us as, as we fear um, because you know, the, the band leaders and the promoters and the tour managers and the MDs and everybody you worked for who had your best interest at heart before all this, like, you know who those people are. Yes, I do. And they're going to have our best interest at heart now going forward. Yes. Um, yes. So I think, you know, uh, it, it's, it's a good reminder for me to kind of like take inventory of who those people are and use this to... Um, you know, strengthen those relationships and, and, and say, that's who I want to have, you know, that's who's going to have my back at, at this gig in September that may or may not happen. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's like, it's not at all unreasonable to like reach out to some of those people because, and, and have that conversation like, Hey, I've been thinking like, what, what are you preparing as a band leader or a management team or, a venue for safety and mm -hmm. like how can i be aware of what you're working on how can i help mm -hmm. how can i um prepare myself to um be part of this yeah just part like a like get back to work in a safe way that like benefits everyone uh so this next interview clip that i want to play for you is with Steve Sinatra, this was shortly after our 200th episode, so this goes back a ways. And uh, this is one of those rare two-part interviews, and Steve gets in the weeds with some heavy stuff that uh, it might require multiple listens to try and really understand where Steve was coming from. Uh, as, as Dave Elich likes to say, it gets into the, the woo-woo of the universe uh, <laughs> with this stuff. But... Um, Steve talks about, uh, you know, how our perspective, uh, positive and negative, can affect the situation, whether it be in life, in general, with music, with gigs, and different things like that, and and how much these n this negative and positive energy can affect your life and your situation. You know, it, it's more than just having a good attitude on the gig. He really gets into some heavy stuff. I mean, it, it affected Steve so much that he was just killing it here in Nashville. He lives in California now, but he was killing it in the studio with a really great creative artist, young artist, and just doing so well. And he, he just, he wasn't happy. He, he, life wasn't what he, he wanted it to be. He checked off all the boxes. He achieved all the goals that he thought, this is what I want to be doing. And then at the end of it, he's like, I, I'm, I'm not happy. This isn't what I want. Why? Why aren't I happy if I've done all these things? And that's another one of those things at a point in my life when I, when I heard this, when I had this conversation with Steve that was so important for me to make sure that I had a healthy relationship with my drums, with my music, and I prioritized things in my life that made music just as sweet as it was when I was at different stages in my life. So and um, I think if, if I could interject, yes. like you, you did that interview almost two years ago. And, and just in the last year, you know, we've all had all this time. I think a lot of us have, have had, you know, a little bit of a come to Jesus with ourselves about what is important to us yep. um, in, in music, in life, you know, what kind of music do we want to play? What kind of musician do we want to be? Um, and, uh, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to hearing this again, cause I think it'll, it'll ring true, uh, especially now. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm glad you said that. Uh, it is Steve's, uh, uh, just a very thoughtful, uh, guy and, and it, it, it came out in his playing and his musicality, but, uh, 
Now, check this out. Uh, here's a clip for, from Steve Sinatra. There, I want to quote you in, in one of your, the des- a description that you have on your website. It says, uh, I've concluded that no matter what we pursue in life, if we're not happy and fulfilled from within first, then anything we give our time and energy will be colored by our unfulfillment. Yeah. Uh, would you like me to elaborate on sure, that? Sure, sure. It's the perspective paradigm that we were talking about earlier in in the interview. If you perceive something as negative, then you're going to be projecting a negative signal out there. And while that negative thing is is happening or that negative perception is happening, that there's also a positive perception happening at the same time that you could be choosing but you might not be at any point in time. We have the option to choose the positive or the negative. And when we choose both, when we see that there are, again, like I'd mentioned before, positives and the negatives and negatives and the positive, we can let go and detach from any label that we put on something and just have the experience and then learn and grow from that experience and then pass that knowledge on that we've acquired through having that experience and share it with the people we're working with and yeah with yeah. with anybody you mm-hmm. know with, mm-hmm. with 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 those that that are are seeing what 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 you're doing and are drawn to you magnetized to you um mm-hmm. and wanting to know how you're doing what you're doing and to to kind of share that that information with them so that they can perpetuate that that cycle you you talk about you, you know just like people feel it when you walk into a room and, and how it, it can lead to 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 better relationships to 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 more work to more to to more gigs to to better gigs that you know we've we've mentioned on this podcast through through the years and ad nauseum about you know there's the 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 playing element and then there's how you get along with people you know uh not only just on the road but sometimes in the session itself and how that makes you a valuable candidate for many gigs but that that is that is just kind of the tip of the iceberg with with a lot of this stuff there's a there's just a general energy that you're talking about that really um let's see, say magnetizes people to to you yeah there's the best terminology that i've come across is there's a universal substance and we have the ability through our thoughts actions and emotions to change or manipulate <clears throat> that that universal substance and whether we're consciously choosing to do it or not, we're always having an effect on the universe at large and our, our intimate universe. Mm-hmm. I realized that in order to be the type of player that I wanted to be, in order to, again, you know, when I was digging in the weeds, because I love researching, you know, to, to know what made Steve Gadd, Steve Gadd, you know, to know what made these great players who they are, the ones that, you know, transcended all the the, the obstacles, uh, the Vinnie Calutas, the ones who just stood the test of time as amazing players. I've learned that what leads to that and what makes that possible is something that starts totally aside from the instrument, totally aside from, from music. And, and I had to dig, you know, to a level that I think very few, if, if any, have, have, have dug to, mm-hmm. uh, lit- literally looking at it on a universe, cosmo, you know, metaphysical uh, level of what's happening you know, and how that translates all the way back 
to when I sit down at the instrument and why these, you know, people are that, um, are the way they are. This is the level that I've, I've ended up going to and, and being a consummate student and researching. And I've, I've found that I've, I've gone to a place that I would have never ex- expected um, to go. And it was so far away from, from music and so far away from my instrument. And I'm so glad that I did. And I'm bringing all of that back to my instrument, back into music one of the most memorable interviews uh, I did in 2020 was with my buddy Christopher Alice, who is a fantastic LA-based drummer. Um, it was it was the longest interview I did. I think we talked for almost two hours because that's what we did when I lived in LA. We would drive around LA looking for good ramen on a regular basis <laughs> and just <laughs> shoot the shit about about anything. Um, but the reason I wanted to include this clip from Christopher was that. Um, he has a unique perspective on how, you know, real life can barge in on your music career. His wife has been battling cancer for the last seven years. And uh, even though uh, the experience we're all going through with uh, COVID is not at all the same, um, it is similar in that, you know, something completely out of your control is affecting your life and your career and your day-to-day experience. And I think uh, what Christopher has to say about the the ways he deals with this and the way he processes it um, is is just really useful for uh, anybody pretty much at any time, but but especially us now. So, dig Christopher Alice. I'm constantly trying to figure out how can I be the best version of myself for her, for my mother-in-law, yeah, for the rest of my family, and for all of my friends. Right. Um, And I think that leads to um, decisions about, um, you know, diversification, like how can I set myself up to be the healthiest and happiest that I can be? Like when when you um, live for and with someone else and have a partner in that way, um, it certainly did that for me. I was like, you know, if I'm if I'm fucking broke and cranky, then I am not going to (laughs) be. I'm not going to be a good husband <laughs> to be around. Yeah. Um, so yeah. it was, you know, part of that desire to be my best self for her um, led to sort of diversifying my income. And uh, like you said, just like doing what you need to do, um, giving yourself the freedom financially and otherwise to be able to just take care of yourself a little bit. So, you know, that, that did it for me and my wife does not have cancer. So I can only imagine the perspective that came for you, um, in that regard when you, you know, you, you said I have to, uh, do everything I can to just be secure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you definitely, (laughs) it definitely, you know, you grow up real quick. Yeah. I mean, you, you think you think you're growing up beforehand, and then something like that happens. And you're like, oh, right. Yeah. Um, and it certainly isn't anything that you expect. Right. But... And we all say that, like, you know, music is so important to us. But those of us who have a partner in that way, like that partner, is the most important person. Um, and we don't often have to um, prove it, <laughs> you know, because our partners often give us the leeway to put music first sometimes and they sign up for that and they're like this is this is the business we have chosen but then when when like real life shit barges in on it you have to pony up yeah you definitely do and um i think i fail pretty much every day (laughs) and i'm being i'm being completely honest i mean I, i i i think i fail pretty much every day but you know, it's worth getting up in the morning and, you know, and trying again. Right. There's nothing easy about it, but I also understand that I'm like the second or third layer of the onion after Rachel. Mm -hmm. So my perspective is only that as uh, of a caregiver. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I don't have it as difficult as she does, obviously, because I don't have the diagnosis. Right. It's not a me thing. I'm trying to do what I can in order to be the the best caregiver that I can. Yeah. 
but I don't ask the question why, because why, why is a good journalism question, right? <laughs> why is not necessarily a good question in a situation like this, because what it winds up doing, in my opinion, is it victimizes the person who's asking it. Mm. And that's the wrong focus. Why isn't the correct question? The correct question is what now? Mm. Yeah. Because when you ask what now, you're being a bit more active in the way that you're viewing the situation. Yeah. And that's what action is what's needed. Right. Not, you know, pontification. Not reasons. Yeah. Because the reasons that are given are not reasons. Because you can't answer why did this person get cancer. Sometimes you can, you know, you're a lifelong smoker and this and that and the other thing, blah, 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 blah. Right. Then, then yeah, sure, maybe you have mitigating factors that have, you know, put you at a higher risk. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just this, it's a random mutation that can happen to anybody. Unfortunately, it happened to my wife. Right. So what but now? Again, so what now? And what now is, you know, trying to be as educated as you can about the situation mm -hmm. and asking as many questions as you feel you need to and not worrying too much if the medical team gets annoyed with your questions. <laughs> um, though they don't. They're, yeah. they're, they're really they're quite good over there at Cedars. Um, but then you really have to kind of check yourself because even – when we're healthy, there are times where we are not ourselves. Yeah. You know, where we haven't eaten a good breakfast or, you know, we're hungover or, you know, didn't get enough sleep and we're just, just awful to be around. Yeah. Now that's you healthy. <laughs> if you're sick, like, I mean, the, the age old thing, you know, the worst person to have to deal with when they're sick is a man because they turn into a child. Yeah. Um, now, in Rachel's situation, there are times where she gets very, very frustrated and very angry because certain of her capabilities have, you know, have been decreased. Mm -hmm. So things are harder. I can't get angry with her for being angry about the fact that she can't do something that she used to be able to do in the same way. I simply have to sit there and be like, it's, it's cool. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. Take the time that you need. It's it's fine. Mm -hmm. It's okay. I think these concepts, like so, wh what you're talking about, is is patience, acceptance, and what now. And you have had to deal with these things in in a really you know visceral way. Um, but they're they're good lessons for all of us. You know, just in whatever challenges life throws at us, but specifically in music. Like if you approach. You, yeah. If you approach your music career with some patience and acceptance and not why, but what now, um, I think that's a, a much healthier, uh, if not more effective way to, to go about it. It absolutely is. And everybody that I know and that I respect in our community, they seem to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, thinking about, you know, the Blair Sintas and the Brendan Buckleys and the Luke Adamses and the Kevin Stevenses and the, you know, Dave Elitches and, you know, just on down the line. Um, uh, my buddy Craig McIntyre, who is up in Portland now, um, you know, we talk every week and it's just, it's always kind of like, okay, what now? Mm -hmm. you know, how about this? How about that? And, you know, and having to be patient and having to kind of accept the situation as it comes and, and the, and then you move on from there. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it's, there are life lessons that you hope you have at, you know, a particular point in your life, but if you don't and they make themselves known to you, <laughs> boy, howdy, I'll tell you what. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's hard, hard not to know, listen at that point. <laughs> yeah. I mean, when, you know, when, when the knock on the door is basically a howitzer, mm -hmm. you're like, oh, right, got it. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I understand now. I'm right. on board. Got it. Message received. <laughs> yeah. 
so as we're closing up the the three hundredth episode, it's it's crazy to think that we've gotten this far to this number. Uh, we're in December right now interviewing. This is airing January seventh, twenty twenty one. And it'll have been almost six years from the very first episode, which is crazy insane. Uh, going back, looking at the 100th and trying to find some of these clips was a challenge. There's so much that I personally take away from every single guest. Uh, it sounds like hyperbole, but it's not. Uh, the last interview I had was Dave Elich and it was a blast to talk to him. He's, that but, was such a cool interview, and like we're we're getting as big a response about that interview as as any any that we've done. I think he's he's an amazing dude, but it, it, it's a reminder of how the simple conversations with drummers that I know or I don't know just it just blows my world up in how I see my playing, how I see music and drumming. And yep. I'm so thankful for that. And I, I hope that our listeners have that same experience that I have and and that that we're addressing the right topics and asking the right questions that that that, that the listeners would want to hear. Um, uh, one of the interviews that I want to bring up it, just in real quick, just a surprising interview was my conversation with Robin Flans, who's the author of the book about Jeff Picaro. Um, it was surprising because it was just such an intimate conversation, and I was surprised at how you could hear how much she missed Jeff. And, and, it, yeah. and it, it really drew me in to dig deeper into Jeff's catalog and um, just made me that much more of a, of a fan. And it just it, that grew my world even more so. And and then the last thing I'll say is um, not only has it been one of the most completely fucked up years. Completely um, fucked up. Completely fucked up um, for, for a host of reasons. The fact that my drum hero, Neil Peart, which is, I say, my drum hero because I would not be playing drums if it wasn't for Neil Peart. Um, I would not have gone to school for music. I would not have met my wife. I would not have met many of my closest friends. I, I honestly believe that. And to have to, to have surprisingly lost him and found out while Zach and I were on conver in a conversation. Yeah, we were on the phone, and like you just started getting texts like blown up. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, the 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 one time, like okay, that was that was. It was an honor to use this platform to bring in Peter Erskine again and talk to some close friends and talk to some people that have had interactions with him in some capacity. Uh, I, I'm really happy with that interview. And, and then, Zach, you were you participated in that as well. That was a, that yeah. was a big deal. Yeah, um, that was it was it was really uh, like you said, it kind of came it came out of nowhere. But we kind of immediately knew that. We, you know, we wanted to put together an episode about Neil for Neil. Um, so a lot of people had just a, a lot of really cool, interesting things to say about uh, about him, his playing, his legacy. Um, and, you know, you still just can't say enough. Just a, a giant. Yeah, for sure. Um, uh, in, in, in the way of uh, sort of honorable mentions of, uh, you know, other episodes um, that, that are memorable to me, um, I interviewed Tony Coleman, who was uh BB King's drummer for a long time. And, uh, just, you know, like you, you mentioned drummers who have like, you get done with that interview and, and your world is like blown up. Um, and for me, Tony was like, I've, I've had some interviews where you get done with that interview and you're like, wow, that, that guy is one of a kind, like there is only one of him, <laughs> you know? Um, and he's just such a strong personality, such a funny dude. Um, uh, so that was super memorable. Um, again, your your interview with Dave Elich uh, was great. I did a few interviews with with guys who have kind of incorporated second careers into their lives. And, you know, during the last year, I think we've all kind of looked around and wondered, you know, what else we might be able to do or what else do we have to do or what else might we want to do um, other than drumming. And uh, so uh, the interview I did with Tom Knight, um, was really cool. He has a second career as a voiceover artist. 
Um, Billy Brimblecombe uh, is a great Kansas City drummer who is also uh, the uh, leader of a foundation called Steps of Faith. He's an amputee and Steps of Faith uh, gets uh, prosthetics to amputees in need. So that takes up, you know, at least half of his time in, uh, in addition to drumming. And we also interviewed our buddy, Chris Brady, who is one yeah. of the higher ups at Aquarian drum heads. Um, you know, he started out as a gig and drummer in LA and, and went on to the, the product side of things. But just thinking about those interviews is, is kind of like inspirational, um, to me and, and everyone else out there who's like, uh, you know, how, how can I still be in music but but not just completely beholden to the drum set um you know i think that's plan a for all of us is to just play drums all the time and get paid um but you know there are other paths that uh, a lot of people have uh, gone down and found a lot of success and fulfillment with uh other than sitting behind the drums i think that's a really good point to, to also bring up the the fact that when when my friend Mike Jackson and I settled on the name Working Drummer as the name of this podcast, just that title alone really kind of informed ourselves as the kind of the philosophy in which we want to adhere to and and bring some of these lesser known drummers and musicians to, you know, to the front. So just in a more relatable kind of way. Uh, and ha knowing that there are incredible talents like Tom Knight, uh, you know what a, he's a, what an amazing drummer, and like balancing non music with music, uh, mm -hmm. and how great that is, and, and inspirational for for many of us. Um, it it was an amazing year to have p people like Todd Zuckerman and Dave Weckl and Dave Elich and Erskine on a a third fourth time, yeah. I guess including yeah. the Neil Peart uh, tribute. Yep. Uh, that's... I, I got to have a completely self indulgent time with uh, Marcus Finney talking about cooking. We did a whole episode just shooting <laughs> the shit about cooking and food. Uh, I love it, favorites. man. I love it. You know. So, I don't know. There's, there's, uh, as one of Dave Elich's followers on Instagram said, every asshole has a podcast now. <laughs> <laughs> and this one has two. <laughs> this one has two. Uh, so, uh, it, uh, it is amazing to see the, the field grow over the last six years because when we first started, there was, there were some great podcasts. There continues to be some great podcasts about drumming like our friends at Drummer's Resource and, yep. uh, you know, and, and stuff like that. But, but to, to, as the field has grown, uh, it's, it's nice to feel like we're still bringing something unique. Uh, and I hope you all feel that way and you interact with us uh, as much as you feel like you need to and want to. And um, we continue to build this community. Uh, and we just can't say enough about um, the listeners and how that helps inform the direction that we take our interviews and who we interview and, and how we do things. So continue to interact with us. And I just want to say, I'm, uh, I'm grateful to you, Matt, for, for bringing me on to this podcast. It was, you kind of brought me on sight unseen, uh, just like on the, on the recommendation of our buddy, Nick Ruffini, but, um, it's, it's been, uh, it's been great having, this podcast as a platform. It's been great having you in my life as a buddy. Um, and, uh, just look forward, look forward to more. Thanks, man. Yeah, man, dude. Thank you. Uh, this, this, this podcast would not be what it is without you. Appreciate you. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So onward and upward in 2021, uh, super grateful to everyone for listening, for downloading, for following us on social media. Um, it's it's been a it's been a great ride with you. We're 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 continuing on and uh, don't forget to enter the contest. Right, right. Enter the contest. Once you see our post of the three hundredth episode, all you got to do is repost and tag Working Drummer Podcast. And lastly, we just want to say thanks everyone for your continued support over the many years that we've been producing this podcast. Here's to a happy and healthy and safe year as we get into twenty twenty one, and we hope to see you around. Bye-bye.